Hi, everybody. Welcome to Move Crush Count. This is a podcast produced by JNL Marketing. The title of today's episode is How to Increase the Value of Your Business. My name is Scott Joseph, and we are here today, uh, today with special guest Chris Cunningham from C2 Ventures. Chris is an expert when it comes to first identifying what differentiates one business from another and more importantly how to increase the value of those businesses uh, he's graciously agreed uh, to do this interview and share his expertise and knowledge so i want to welcome chris cunningham scott thanks for having me this is gonna be a lot of fun yeah it should be great and so real quick i want to acknowledge where we're at here this is a really sure. cool venue uh it is called please don't tell i've got a good friend in fact uh i should bring him up now robert burke uh, Robert Burke. He is the VP of Proof Media Mix. He's also the Kentucky uh, ambassador for Bullet yep. Bourbon. Yep. And so I was talking to him. I said, hey, who do you know uh, that that you think you should introduce me to? And you were the first one he brought up. Thank you, Bobby. All right. So we owe him two big <laughs> yep. favors, one for introducing yes. us. Uh, but then two, I said, hey, I'm going to go up to New York uh, and do these interviews. I got a few. Do you know of any cool venues, right? And first thing he came up with here was Please Don't Tell, which is a speakeasy. Uh, this is a really cool spot. And uh, not, a, not an easy one to find. No, it is not. I mean, I, yeah, as I told you, hovering outside that door for a few minutes. But now <laughs> now, now I understand the appeal uh, of being down here, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, so we should also say a special thank you for uh, being a very gracious host to Please Don't Tell and Jeff Bell. Um, if you've not been here, find someone who can get you in here. Uh, and make that happen because this is really neat. And the drinks, uh, from a mixology standpoint, second to none. So awesome job. So uh, Chris, thanks again for joining us. Let's jump right in. Sure. All right. So before we get into the specifics, I want the audience that might be out there thinking, you know, C2 Ventures, how's a guy that's looking to raise money, how's that going to help my business right mm -hmm. now, right? Sure. And so I want you to give us a little bit of history on your background, your experience, sure. so that way the audience can quickly identify how this helps them. Great. Um, yeah, so I've been in New York uh, for 20 years. I cut my teeth selling online advertising as far back as 99, 2000. So when the inner interwebs came about, I'm one of those uh, people responsible for polluting it with shitty banners that um, <laughs> that we don't like to uh, to see. Hopefully uh, the, the swear words okay um any anything goes on this show. okay cool um so yeah i mean we have we have paul waiting in the background here i i, I can't put any right, type right. of restrictions all right no restrictions <laughs> i signed the waiver um but i've been in online advertising for for 15 years i started my own company in new york called app savvy which pioneered native advertising on facebook that basically means we help developers monetize so i'm a founder and entrepreneur at heart which is important into you know um regarding our story um but through my experience Experience, Scott I've had a lot of ups and let's call those singles and doubles but I also have had some some tough days as relates to dealing with tough board members and raising capital and not knowing how to hire and running out of money all these things there's an 85% of startup failure rate and when I got to the other side of my app savvy experience I felt that there was a gap as relates to institutional capital venture and founders so i started doing angel investing have you seen the movie jerry Maguire, tom cruise yes as cheesy as it may sound i i really became that sort of agent model for founders to say here's the iceberg this is where the bodies are buried let me help you raise money which is hard let me help you drive revenue which is hard four years of angel investing pretty solid track record which then led me to raise a fund and what i'm doing now is doing early stage pre-seed uh, checks, 150 to 250K. We leave a lot of our fund for reserve follow-on and our LPs, our limited partners, which are investors, are leaning in heavily based on their domain expertise to help the companies we invest in. So summarize that very succinct, I hope, is we are a more hands-on model. We believe experience matters for first-time founders. So we're putting our collective network uh, to work to help the founder journey. Yeah. And so when you're looking at these businesses, right, I would assume you're looking at the ones that are going to be good investments for your clients. Sure. Right? And so what are some of the things that you look at? I mean, I, I clearly you're looking, if, if, if most people that listen to this show feel some type of pressure because they're being marginalized and commoditized, mm -hmm. I, I repeat that phrase over and over mm -hmm. again. So it's all about striking back against that. And to win against that, you've got to do a great job differentiating yourself. Yep. 
So I assume you're looking for businesses that either have differentiated themselves and you're like, wow, this could be something great, mm -hmm. and or have it and maybe haven't identified it yet. Sure. Um, can you dive Expand in a little on that. bit? On, yeah. So we should be here at night with the cocktails because yeah. um, <laughs> uh, it's it's such a longer conversation yeah. um, and it's, 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 uh, it's a hard one to answer. So number one is, this is it starts with the founding team this may sound cl uh, cliche or, or repetitive but this is really about the the founder or founders because you're betting on people to navigate unexpected events in front of them wrong founder can't ha handle it your investment goes sideways so number one is kind of founding team two today is all about technology it's about software we won't invest in a company that doesn't have some level of engineering dna a tactical co-founder, someone that's coded or whatnot. Um, we love and what we look for are industries that are relatively old school, um, inadequate software, but billions of dollars pouring into it, which is a you know your, your TAM, your total addressable market. So an industry, say airline or CRM um, um, or legal, not sexy. Yeah. But 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 a huge market. So you know the market's there. This isn't like will they come? They're already there. Yeah. When you look at the software, it's terrible. So um, who is that? What's that company doing? To answer your question, that is bringing a unique value, a new IP, something differentiated. And the hard part, Scott, will be how do we break through? How do we take clients away? Um, but they're going into a market that we already know. Uh, exist. So you're Does that looking, make sense? Yeah, you're looking for a big ocean of people, but you're trying to find a niche within it. Something like that. Yes. Yeah. And in, in the case of in the case of one of our investments, that does not the, that that doesn't fit that bill. It's a direct to consumer, which we love, and I'll tell you a little bit about the verticals we like. Um, that's uh, a CBD company. So they're out of Boston, started by two former athletes, no cannabis, so 100% um, um, CBD. Um, and they're crushing it. They're using celebrities, influencers, um, and some of the, the biggest cross trainer names on the planet to help promote products that help you with your workout recovery mm -hmm. and sleep. Now, that market is new, right? So this is more a bet on the fact that direct to consumer, we love wellness, and it's a category that if done right and marketed correctly, and maybe with a retail partner, we have the next Dollar Shave Club or the next Away Bag or the next Casper as relates to that category. That's nice. Yeah. All right, so let's dive in. Uh, let's dive right into the specifics. Sure. All right? So what do you think the first step is that a business leader needs to take when it comes to, first off, identifying what differentiates them from everyone else? So... So we're talking about in the context... Because that's of, not always easy to do. No. I mean, I think, um, so in the context of a founder developing a company that has something differentiation or some, some, some sort of IP, it really comes down from our perspective is what is your unfair advantage? What makes you and your team or your product uniquely positioned against what is out there? It could be your engineers, it could be a patent, it could be a trademark, it could be uh, it could be the founders have 20 years of domain expertise in a particular domain and now they've uh, they've broken out. That's okay. So there's not one sort of defined answer, but I do think from an investor perspective, it's important to understand why you and your team, because this is going to be hard and it may not work, and that's what venture is, but if you if it is to work and we are going to see a return, what do we actually see that you and your team actually have that makes it somewhat unique or competitive? If you can't answer that, if you're going out today to start a company, I think if you ask, that's that, let that, me that's ask a, you, that, that's a problem. I, yeah. I would actually maybe rewind and and take a step back. The problem, Scott, is a lot of people. It's glamorous and sexy nowadays to start a company, and unfortunately, you don't start a company. Start a company. The best companies are started based on pain that they've experienced. Yeah. They, ex they lost somebody because of cancer. They couldn't travel from X to, they, they experienced a frustration or pain, so they wanted to develop a company, which happens to be, now they're a founder. Not, I wanna be a founder, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go try to be a founder. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. And so I think 
uh, I think you hit the nail on the head there. It, it is not always easy to d find out. I think if you were to pull, and you're looking at businesses, uh, if you ask most of these people what their differentiator is, do some of them struggle to tell you? Um, they do. Um, they do. Um, and sometimes that's okay. So remember, so C2 Ventures, we write early checks. That's right. Pre-seed, seed, everything up to A. What that means for your audience that may not know, three to five million dollars is typically an A. Now you have enough money to hire your executive team. So we're taking a gamble that you have some level of MVP, minimal viable product, you have some revenue of customers, but we're early stage. So it's, 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 it's very risky. Um, we don't expect the founder or founding team to be able to answer everything perfectly. That would just be complete bullshit. Yeah. We're, what we're saying is they're answering these in a thoughtful way. They have a plan. If we give them a half a million bucks, they know how to spend it over 18 months. They have some answer to your differentiation. This is how we're going to approach it. We can see it. But to be honest, Scott, like there's also a lot of, um, I hope this works. And any venture capitalist that says that that's not the case is full of shit. Yeah. That you're, there's a classic gif or image of somebody, um, what what it's like to be a startup founder. And it's high speed and it's your base, there's like this kid building a track as the train's coming. Yeah. That, that's, that's what a startup um, experience is like. So back to my initial comment, the founding team, the people running the company, that is your number one unfair, I mean, unfair advantage, call it, um, potentially competitive in if they have domain expertise that, that we look for, for where we play. If you're a later stage investor, you're going to be looking for revenue and margin and profitability and more logos. For us, where we play, which is early, yeah. founding teams is a, is a critical, criti critical uh, component. Yeah, and I, I yeah. think, you know, what I see as a marketer in, in dealing with various clients, if I ask, uh, you know, we're heavy in auto. And so if I was to ask a bunch of, of dealers what differentiates them, uh, you know, one of the common answers, well, are, are a buzzword today or two words, customer experience. Mm. It always frustrates me when I hear that answer because how do you market that? Mm -hmm. In other words, and here's the problem I have with it. I know how to market it, all right? But the, the problem I have is, is I see a lot of dealers or even any vertical business that wants to use that as their differentiator, that's all they say. Mm -hmm. In other words, come to us because you'll have a great customer experience. Mm -hmm. Well, the end customer, they don't say, first off, why do we even assume what a customer, that a sure. customer knows what that means? Yeah. <laughs> well, and what makes it unique? What makes it great? Yeah. That's what needs to be communicated, and that's the true differentiator. I agree. I mean, I would even kind of take almost another angle to this conversation, which is, in some cases, the best products don't need to be marketed. So let's talk about you know Tesla, or maybe the limited ads that Apple did back in the day. If your product is, now from a consumer perspective, you need to market, yeah. right? But if you're a B2B or B2C, um, if your product is really good, there will you you could potentially lean in on organic uh, referral, organic recommendation because your product, whatever it it's, it, it does, um, is so above the rest yeah. that it gets people excited. So you don't need to do the gimmicky, gimmicky um, you know, our customer service or whatnot. Again, car car dealership, not my domain expertise. Yeah. Maybe that's you know that's a different sort of. That's a different swim lane, yeah. but from a from a from a from a early stage venture product, hardware consumer, um, you know, um, delivery on, delivery on expectation and delivering a very healthy product roadmap for your customer may actually get you the same results as you know try, trying to create some sort of. Um, uh, marketing message that gets someone excited. So let's say you're you're dealing with a company, you're excited about it, and it's early, like you said, that's where your niche is, and they do struggle. They don't necessarily know what's differentiating them. Mm -hmm. How do you get? How do you help them get past that to be able to identify that? It's a great question. Um, we'll give them that feedback. We always feel our responsibility. Um, so we saw 250 companies last year, yeah. all organic, all word of mouth, yeah. no marketing for C2V, the fund. 
Um, and if we pass on something, we feel like we owe that founder so the responsibility to sort of give feedback in regards to why we passed. Yeah. A lot of cases, Scott will say, you're not giving us enough confidence that you actually know this answer. We're, let's stay yeah. friends. This is not a BS sort of classic. Let's stay friends, hit these milestones, come back to us and show us what you've been able to accomplish bootstrapping this more. Show us what you've been able to do without raising institutional capital, maybe it was an angel round. Show us a product that we can touch and feel that gets us more excited. So in, in a lot of cases, you don't need to make, you don't have to be so aggressive where you need to make that decision that moment. You can very much say, hey, you're, 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 you're in my thoughts, you're in my queue, you're in my pipeline, but let's revisit where you are, because guess what? You're not where you think you are yet. Yeah, You know what I mean? No, I think that's great. And that's what, because the people that are listening or, or watching this, depending on their, I guess their, the channel that they're, they're paying attention to. Hopefully um, watching, because yeah, I hopefully. mean, I think we, we look great <laughs> under this speakeasy light. So hopefully watching. Um, I, I want them to see this because whether you're established or not, understanding what makes you, you're different, what makes you unique, especially mm -hmm. in, if you're in a commodity business or you're feeling margin pressures, right? That is so important because if you don't know exactly what it is and you and know that for sure and that's what appeals to consumers, sure. then you're gonna have a hard time fighting fighting that pressure. Yep. And winning against it. Correct. And and maybe you To your point, that's if someone doesn't know it, yeah. They're in the business. You should. It's not up to you as a, an investor to, to be able to tell them. You may not know it either. They've got to know it, but it clearly uh, puts you in a spot where you're unsure. Correct, and maybe puts us in a spot where we're we have no interest in investing because what you can why would you want to maybe why do you want to invest in a commoditized space? So to take a step back for us because maybe this could be helpful for context. We love software companies. Yeah. We love fintech companies. So financial tech companies, Wall Street's down the road. They're not innovative. So companies that are helping in fintech. We love companies in travel. Um, we think those are exciting. Uh, we love direct-to-consumer companies. Um, that's also an exciting uh, vertical. So in a lot of these, uh, a lot of these spaces. Okay, so um, yeah, so we're we are we're probably not going to be as excited about writing a check where we have 30, 40 people that have given us their money to trust our process and judgment to make sound investments in a heavily commoditized area unless back to our earlier discussion, there are there's there's clarity in regards to unfair advantage, IP, yeah. um uh, intellectual property, your moat, what allows you to enter this? And just to be clear, Scott, from our perspective, that's a tech, that's a tech code conversation. That is not a marketing logo, customer success. You know what I mean? Uh, yes, that, that, that's 100%. not going to, that's not going to fly. So you, you don't invest pe with people that just have a beautiful logo? No, that's not, that's <laughs> not, unfortunately, that's not going to do it. Yeah. No. All right, so what do you think the second step business leaders need to take when it comes to, uh, I guess, identify or, or I don't want to say create, creates the wrong word, um, promote that key differentiator? Um, so they've identified it. Yeah. All right. What has to happen next? So, I, I mean, blocking and tackling here, but, and you'd be surprised how, simple, how simple many, always is the, the, best. The, the ability to succinctly explain what you do and how you do it. Yes. And, and I got to tell you, uh, you know, if I was starting a company tomorrow, I, I would, cr I would kill PowerPoint slides. I think they're god awful. And I would get into, uh, uh, using video as yeah. a format to, to explain and market your, 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 your business. So, um, you know, I mean, number two is. It is is rallying around and making a case in regards to what your company does, um, where it's going, 
um, why you want to invest or partner or whatever those sort of asks are, and to do it in a way that, I mean, as you know, attention spans are shorter and shorter. How are you going to make some impact um, on a first impression? If you're, again, wearing the venture hat, wh how are you going to do that? And I got to tell you, a lot of founders, business leaders that we've encountered, they may have a really great idea, but, they're, but they don't know how to uh, communicate it. So that it, there is an art and science um, uh, around around pitching your I pitching think, your products. I think that you, I, I'm glad you said that because, and I can even s say this from my own personal experience. Even if you know what differentiates you from everybody else, mm -hmm. it is not always easy to articulate it in a very simple and clear, with a simple and clear message. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're the business owner or someone running something. You're involved in it so deep that you want it to be perfect, and you start thinking, "Well, we got to tell them this, and we got to tell them that, and we got to." And then all of a sudden, the message gets That's diluted, right. and it's not effective. That's right. And so, um, me personally, I am much better at making sure that happens for our clients. But when I have to market myself, yeah, well, we're awful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't market hard. myself at all. Sometimes it's actually easier, Scott, to help someone else tell their story. Yeah. Um, and this is, uh, you know, mid forties, uh, stage of my life where you're, I'll hear someone pitch their business and I'm like, that, that, that's nice. But what you're actually doing. And then they're like, how do you do that? And I'm like, trust me, I suck at everything. <laughs> but when you hear pitches your whole life and you pitched, yeah. sometimes you're, you, you have the inapt ability to actually, uh, tell someone else their, their, their story a little bit better. The other thing too, just as, as we talked about sort of differentiation and unfair advantage and. Um, I think there is more and more and should be more and more attention in regards to the health and sustainability of the business. So specifically um, your margins, specifically user acquisition. How are you getting customers? How, uh, how much does it cost for you to get a user? Um, how are you retaining them? And again, this doesn't matter if you're selling cars or french fries or I mean, it's all kind of the same dynamics. Yeah. And what does that do for your revenue? And can you be profitable? So the other side of that is a company called WeWork. Um, that's obviously sarcasm, but like, of course, you know, WeWork, massive implosion, billions of dollars poured into it, but everyone's kind of looking at the top line revenue. This is like in the last year, SoftBank, you know, one of the largest, most credible, uh, you know, funds on the planet. And they miss those things. So I, I, think, I think there's, it, you know, getting back to sort of the blocking and tackling to the health and sustainability of the business, can, when and how can you not rely on venture, which is meant to be the boost to get you going right. or to help you scale, but how can you get to a point where you're self-sustainable? Yeah. And, and I wanted to make sure I called that out for anyone, you know, anyone in your audience that's thinking about what they're doing on their business, which is explain that story because that's a very important one. How do you get to a point where, you know, anyone can kind of start something and raise money and get their thing, their business going, but are you gonna survive six months or one year or two years? Because you don't have a plan. You don't have a financial model that makes sense. That's right. And I, I just wanna, you know, I, want, I think that's an important um, kind of piece of the equation to call out. So if this is all about how to increase the value of a business and we've keyed, we've keyed in on key differentiators right if you have if you're great let's take the first two steps you've been able to identify exactly what makes you unique what differentiates your business from other people two you've actually done a good job communicating it right and the health of the business is, mm -hmm. is strong or it's it's trending in the direction that you want it to go what type by doing just those two and we'll get to the third but just those two, what does that do to the value when you're sitting here looking at companies? What does that do to the overall value of a company? You mean sort of in the context of like, does the company value? Is the valuation of, so you're looking, if we're going to invest, you're doing some type of evaluation. Here. Sure, yes. All right, so yes. if someone is very good and is clearly identified, they're coming to you, they right. want an investment, right? Right, right. This is what makes us unique. This is what makes us different. This is how we're communicating this. Right. And here's our acquisition cost. Here's right, our right, margins, right. all this. What's the difference in evaluate, uh, uh, the value of a company that does that sure. versus someone 
winging it or hasn't been as good as those in those first two steps? Well, I think it's as easy as their ability to raise capital. So most companies can't raise money. And the one that's able to sort of support that story and back it up and Scott, no different than dating boys or girls, if you have optionality and you have another term sheet or you have another, you know, you, you, you can you can politely walk away from the conversation. That's the most powerful uh, tool in your in your toolkit, which yeah. is uh, the ability to actually um, have options. The table. Those that don't have options, yeah. it's problematic. So um, so if, if a founder comes into us and says, here's what we're doing, here's our, our market, here's why we're unique, we're excited about it, um, our investors will be excited about it, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we, and they say our, our, our valuation's $8 million, Listen, if, if it if it feels if it's somewhat in a threshold that supports it based on their kind of their forecast, we're not going to beat we're not going to beat them down. We're going to beat them up. That that's not the good that's not a good start of a long term partnership. But if there's something that may not feel right and they can't support it, but we like it, that's then we'll have that hard conversation about you know what your company is actually worth for, right? And that's you know today, and that's where we're comfortable. And if you're not, that's also okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So, so I think the valuation is very much tied to, uh, or can be tied to, sort of your your supporting data points as well as, uh, you know, kind of again summarizing everything we talked about, their ability to sort of communicate, but also optionality. All right. Um, so you got the first step, identify. Second step, articulate it. Make sure it's healthy. Third step. What's the third step that kind of completes this in terms of increasing, and and really nailing down this differentiator right to increase the value yeah um so you know we we talked about team we talked about uh business plan we talked about uh sort of value proposition and and sort of a you know a a a, a healthy company i i think um i think having um showing proof points and traction and this may not be in the exact order that you're you know this what, is on what the, do you mean by that so customers logos you know what have you done independently the most powerful gift the most uh, most important powerful message that i think a founder uh or ceo can 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 do independently is to build as much as they can on their own to show as much sweat equity that they ate ramen noodles, that they had to borrow money, that their credit card almost went out. It like, I don't give a, sh I don't care yeah. that that's that, that happened to you. Show me that you, you know, that you're suffering a little bit. Show me, you're all in. show me that risk that you took. Yeah. Again, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not, not emotional. I, I had to do that. Yeah. And because at the end of the day, this shit is really, 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 really hard. Starting a company is the hardest thing imaginable. Most don't make it, okay? It's just like impossible. So you're, you're increasing your odds of the selection process and betting on people that, exactly how you summarized it, have been willing to put, you know, kind of everything in and willing to lose everything. I always like to use the example of like run into a, you know, a, a burning house, which is a terrible sort of uh, picture. But it, but it, but it makes the point. So um, we think about that. We look for that. So now, so now, Scott. So summer. So now you come to me and say, "Hey, Chris. Um, you know, we met a year ago. We were kind of here, and and this is what we've done. We we've, we've just signed up Coca Cola and Spotify and Uber. We have three team members. We were able to secure three hundred thousand dollars from friends and family. This is where the market is. And now we can look back and be like, wow." Look at what this founder has done. Hard yards. There are such. There's so much more bankable, yeah. right? Yeah. Than 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 the other Joe Schmo, which is, hey, I have an idea. Give me money like that. But by the way, that's 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 not gonna. That won't. That won't work. Won't work. You know. Uh, uh, I don't know if this is a good analogy or if it aligns or not, but the sweat equity part, the the risk and heaven skin in the game. Um. So we deal with a lot of auto manufacturers, people that supply auto manufacturers. Shell Oil is a, a good example. Um, we have these partnerships, and in the in our industry, a lot of it's uh, talked about co-op. All right, even Shell Oil will throw co-op dollars 
at us and say, hey, we want we want to reward this this auto dealer. We want to do this for this auto manufacturer, and they will have uh, funds that they throw at that. And they're like, all right, we just want you to set up this many campaigns and do it. Right? We'll pay for it. And so that happened initially, and those campaigns are mediocre at best. Yeah. And so quickly we realized we no longer want to go to dealers with an all-in plan because when they don't have any of their own money in the campaign, everything gets half-assed. Yeah. And and nothing gets worked. And so because they don't, it's no risk to them. Oh wow! So if if it works, it's it's over and above. It didn't cost me anything. But when they have money in it. They work the campaign better. Sure. Everything, every process is paid attention to. Sure. And so we really set up a much better uh, thing there where the co-op dollars or if it's money coming outside of their normal co-op programs, it's a percentage. Yeah. And it's harder on us because you got to sell and convince sure. or persuade the dealer to do that. But for them, it's much be- they're much better off. They're better off. Yep. Makes so, sense. Yep. Yep. So, uh, you know, I don't know if that was a good... No, 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 it, segue, does, it does, it does. It that's, it, it, that's what I'm thinking when you were saying that. It, 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 it's a different industry, but it's, uh, there, 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 there are a lot of different parallels. Yeah. Um, um, no one wants to invest or be with the guy or, or get into a, some type of business situation with a person that has no risk or, or, or correct. Uh, yeah. And I can tell you, look for, for, you know, every week we talk to probably, you know, maybe four or five new companies and this is just the ones we talk to, not the ones that we pass on via email politely um the there there are ones that just you know scott you can they just stand out it's an energy level it's attraction level they've they've gotten so many proof points on their own and you can like you know it's kind of like when you meet a good friend or your wife or your partner and like in the first 10 15 minutes you're like i want to be a part of this person and i'm not going to shy away from that being a very real energy, a very real thing. Uh, there's lots of other people where you're like, something feels wrong. I mean, you know, like you, you have to know this and you've experienced this in your own life. So that, that is, that's very much a draw uh, to, to get our attention yeah. to dig in further on the, on, on the business. And then one more thing I'd like to add is beyond that, certainly something that we care about and a model that we lean in on is uh, the collective power of getting, which is unusual, and new for venture, how do you get our investors that generally are like, make me money? That's priority number one. Yeah. We're capitalists. But number two. It is a profit business. I want to help the companies. <laughs> it is a profit business. Um, I'd be in a lot of trouble if it wasn't. But number two would be, how do I help these companies? Yeah. So think about that. Because that's also why they, they're, I would imagine not everybody's coming to you for money only. Correct. They, they want help. They, yeah. They I mean, need if the you, guidance. We're not, you know, promoting it too hard. But if you go to our website, c2ventures.co, you'll see some incredibly high profile people that, again, I'm never, I'm not the smart guy in the room. They're the smart guy in the room. I was just smart enough to be able to bring these people together. But um, now imagine you're, you're building a business that has some, let's just stick with auto, that has a auto component. And we have, we have people that have worked um, 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 you know, within that industry. It's a no-brainer, right? right? To bring those people to the table. That's right. That's our. That's what we're doing from a investment thesis. That's great. It's not just the check. Yeah. The check is great. Yeah. But it's harder than the check. Yes. When you, if you Google, it's easy to if, go through the money. If anyone Google's at home, some you know startup failure rate, um, it's gonna probably show somewhere around eighty-five percent, which is astonishing. When you peel back the onion even further and you look at the data. They're all repeat mistakes. Do you, do you have kids? Yes. Okay, so I have two kids. So I equated this no different than they're eight and six. Imagine not teaching my boys table manners, the dangers of a crosswalk, or how to look an adult in the eye. So how are we giving founders money and expecting them to crush it without guidance? Right. They make the same mistakes. Not because they're not great people. Not because they're being shady. Not because you didn't pick... Because experience, why experience go, matters. Why go through... If it took you 10, 20 years, you've been doing this for 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. 20 years, all the mistakes that you've learned from over the years, why, especially if you're investing money uh, in a company, why make them go through the same 20 years? 100%. Let's just cut that down to two or three and avoid some of these mistakes. Fist bump to that, man. That's it. (laughs) That's the model. That's it. That's like in simple context, um, um, something that we 
we um, it, it, we but just collectively we think is for anyone to think about their business how how can they apply that same yeah. logic yeah you know you bring up the energy uh, we've interviewed Grant Cardone on this show I don't know if you're familiar with him if if not he's gonna be upset cause okay he, he expects hi, everyone Grant. to know him. okay hi Grant <laughs> right. um, keep killing it Grant we went down to Miami interviewed him unbelievable as soon as you walk in the door and I've walked into a lot of companies I have never in my life felt an energy yeah um, no one had to say a word to me yeah I mean it was you could feel it yeah yeah that's a real thing it was awesome it's a real thing so I, I I'm, I'm a big believer in, in what you just said there yeah all right and so, by the way in an organization as you know it's got that trickles through the whole you know that that's the water that hits the water cooler that's a that's a real wave where yeah. everyone starts feeling it and that's a real that's a real thing that's yep. exactly yeah. right so let me let's go into this then I think that's a good segue what what's the right mindset for a business leader to have to really be able to either differentiate or re increase the value of their 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 business um because you're interviewing the people too right I think, and again, I know I've hit this a few times, but I, I'm just going to come back to yeah. it because it, it, I, I think those that understand, uh, that take care of their people and are people people, there are some terrible, terrible founders out there, yeah. like like total assholes, right? And and how you treat people genuinely, not not on the surface, how you treat people, how you treat your employees, how you look after them, if there's a trust component. So like first and foremost, like what kind of culture does this company have? Is it like helicopter? What are you what are you doing? Can you work from home because you trust that they're going to get the shit done? Like so those one if you create something where there's trust and you take care of your people and you have a good product, sky's the limit. You can have a very hardworking, smart founder, but he's an asshole. Yeah. That that will never that doesn't have longevity. So um, um, yeah, I mean, I you know the, 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 these are um, these are these are they sound pretty obvious, but they're not generally um, um, sort of being executed in practicality. Um, but those are a great point. Crit critical pieces. How you look after people, what kind of trust, what kind of culture have you created? Whether it's transparency, put we when I ran AppSavvy, we had that stuff on the on the walls. Yeah, you know, um, we had our we had our values on the wall. We did as a co-founder, me and my uh, co-founder at the time, Michael. We didn't create the values. We kind of set the stage. The employees set it together. I I love that because when I when I talk to businesses and I ask them, you know, what are your core values? It's not about, and they give me their list, and how did you come up with that, right? You don't get to create your core values. That mm -hmm. is not what it is. Your mm -hmm. core values are what you are as a company when you're at your best, mm -hmm. right? You're not always there, and not every individual is going to be that 100% of the time every, you know, 365 days a year. Correct. And, and, but when you're, at your, whenever, when you're operating at your best or when an individual employee is operating at their best, these are the core values we have. Your core values are, are that. They're established, but have you done an, a good idea or done the right thing to identify what those are Correct. and document them? Correct. Right? Correct. So you didn't just sit there and say, this is what we want to be. Correct. No, no. Because that, that, that's, that's, that's not the true. No, no. If that's what you want to be, but you're not there yet, then it's not a core value. And, and, and people aren't stupid. And what you say you want to do and how you want to do it People will pick up on that, and if you're, and if those two things are hidden, you actually can almost take a step back as the founder or the CEO because your, your kind of core team will put a lot of that into practical, into practicality and into motion. Yeah. And it's a beautiful thing when it happens, and when when it, when when it doesn't happen, it's not as pretty. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, th those are. Um, could that you know all these things, Scott, are so much interconnected. Like starting a company in differentiation, leadership, hiring, culture. I mean, it's one big flywheel. Yeah. Right. I mean, they're really all very uh, connected, as relates to like outcomes. Yeah. You know, most people probably get too much hung too hung up on like, oh my god, that company sold for a billion and that person became rich and million. Like, yeah, that's all great. And I'm not saying money is not interesting. But but if you kind of look 
look deeper into how, what, where. Look at Plaid, maybe off here, but you know, fintech company, two billion dollars. Maybe it was five billion, but two to five to Visa. Five years, seven years, great culture, hardcore product in fintech, um, and probably hit all these things. So my point is, if you really wanted to study, and your audience should be curious and want to look, and you know, some of the best companies, what? What do those things have in common? And there's some incredible books. Yeah. There's some great people to follow on Twitter. And you'll there, there is, uh, Scott, there is pattern recognition in regards to a lot of the things that we're talking about, yes. that, that, that the output is a successful company. Um, well, that's what Cardone says too. He doesn't, I asked him, you know, what people does he look to for advice? And he goes, I don't, I look at big, huge companies and I wanna know what they're doing. Yeah, and then I find the similarities. Yeah, that makes because sense. Because most people look at other industries, and I agree with this because I, I think the best breakthroughs come when you look outside your industry and you see an idea, and you're like, "How can I implement or integrate that yeah. into my own business applications?" And so his viewpoint is, I look at other industries, huge companies. Yeah. All right, that have just dominated. Yeah. And what are my not a, not they're different. What are my similarities? Yeah. And, and how can I bring that in? So, 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 I love so, that. so by the way, I love that too. I'm coming at to that same point just sort from a, um, from a um, you know, when companies are generally created and you look at, say, some of the direct-to-consumer, Casper or Away Bags or Warby Parker, these are direct-to-consumer examples that are now billions of dollars. When you listen to the founders on how I built this podcast or whatnot, and of course our podcasts are going to have are gonna be way bigger than those one day, yeah. you listen to their story, and this one, it's, this one already is. Oh, this is the biggest of all time, <laughs> and, the, and after this interview, it's game changer for all of us. Um, but but when you look at their stories, it's because Jen had a broken bag, and she was like, "Why can't I charge my bag?" Or the razor broke, or why am I paying? Yeah. Eight dollars for a razor. You know, what I mean? what, a little while ago I mentioned, and I don't know if I made it super clear. I think the best ideas are born out of total frustration, um, yeah, because because large large companies are you know slow moving bureaucracy etc. Um, a a a pain that you personally because the bet like if you're going to run in to go do a startup, you you should feel like very emotionally connected to it. Yep. Those sorts of ideas, and you're working somewhere that you're like, I've been, you know, hundreds of people here. This is what we do, but we do a terrible job at it. No one's listening to me. I have a better way to build this mousetrap. Yeah. Again, basically where you're going, it's just a different, you know, sort of a different analogy in regards to how you can uh, get to the starting point. Because yeah. I think a lot of people struggle with what, when am I going to come up with that idea? Or how do I come up with that idea? Or I want to go start something? And I think that's completely the wrong way of thinking about it. Yeah. Like if you actually think about your experience and um, you know what your superpower is, which you know is our, our podcast, you should start there. What, based on your experience... We'll let you plug that real quick. What, what is your podcast? So our podcast is uh, the Superpowers Podcast. So superpowerspodcast.com. I, lo I love that name. And the, and, the, and one of the things, Scott, I've always been, you know, dinner part, if you and I were ha having dinner and, and crushing some cocktails, yeah. um, which again, I wish we were. We, we need to do it here. We need to do that here. <laughs> um, at some stage, I would have um, attempted to, this is before the show, yeah. said, Scott, you know what your superpower is? And I, I would attempt to summarize it. Or what is your superpower? So... The idea of the show was born out of that what we take people on a journey. Yeah. Where are you born? Where are you from? Tell us what was your side hustle, which I think is always a really fun like thing. Like when you're, you know, and then um, then me and my co-host Bill Weiss, we try to summarize to the best of our ability what your superpower is. So we've had 10, 10, 10 shows. I love podcasts. Awesome. Super grateful to be here with you today. It's What's a lot of the fun. most creative or interesting superpower you heard when you asked that question? Yeah, good question. I mean, there's a bunch. Um, um, one that one that someone gave, and you're like, "Whoa, never heard of anything like that before." Yeah, I mean, like it's this is it's it, there's a long story, just like these shows is an hour yeah. that to a successful founder. But you know, some of them could be as simple as just uh, really understanding um, people, emotional intelligence. Yeah. awareness you know a lot of people just don't even understand how to read a room yeah. so it could be you know it could be something like that um, I think you know in, in a more tactical sense 
people that understand how to build a product and r- uh, surround themselves with engineers how to to build a product. I can't do that. Oh, yeah. But you know, some people do. So I don't have the patience. Eat, for that. I'll tell you this: out of the nine or ten shows, there has been no consistent. That's great. Um, uh, theme and um, yeah, so we all you know everyone has one. You just gotta exploit it. So that's that's the show. Where do you think a lot of business leaders? So I'm trying to build my business, right? I'm, I'm I'm differentiating it or trying to. Where do a lot of business leaders waste time in trying to do one or two of those things? What's, uh, a, what's a, in other words, they come to you and they say, "We're doing this, this, and this," and you're in the back of your mind, you're like, "That's a waste of time. That's a waste of time." It really doesn't impact you. Yeah, I mean, I think probably a lot of that is tied to. Um, you know, I think a lot of that's probably tied to how much sort of testing and learning uh, and iterations they have sort of explored to test their own thesis. Yeah. You know, actually said another way, Scott, uh, my, you've kind of mentioned some of your, you know, your learnings and frustrations when you hear these pitches. One of mine is when you hear a founding team talk about something that in their head they want or maybe their girlfriend was like hey wouldn't it be cool if we had an app that went like oh what kind of product research have you done how many people have you sampled how many people it could be like this pen the pen was this and they were like oh, i like the pen but the pen should do that and then it gets better and then it gets better that you know what i mean yeah any founding team should never build a company based on what's in their head that's suicide. Um, you, let me, I'm going to go, be, go back to Cardone. Let me be clear. You may have a starting point of this, this, I, this thing that's going to write on paper. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Does it turn? Is it silver? Does it go in your? You know, don't ever do that on the Give table on a, a on a podcast. <laughs> no. I was doing great. Um, I just broke the thousand dollar pen. Um, by the way, I blame you for such a large pen. Um, um, but. You know, you get the idea. And then there's an iteration and you talk to people and that's how you develop a product that people want, right? Yeah. Is talk, and, and again, the opposite of that is we're gonna, me and my buddy is like, we're like drinking beer and like we came up with this idea. Like that's, 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 a, that's, that's a disaster. You're not the first person that said that and I'm glad because I, to me, important points, I love hearing things, you brought up culture, it's something that comes up a lot in our, in our interviews. Um, but chasing something that your heart wants is can also be a death sentence. Yes. Yes. So Cardone made it simple. He goes, I wasted 20 years of my life chasing what my heart wanted instead of, he goes, people wanted what, he was talking to me, he goes, people wanted what you had. Yeah. All right. They want, mark, they want traffic and sales. Right. And so he goes, they didn't want sales training. He goes, so I chased that thinking I could change the industry and this and yep. that. And I wasted 20 instead of just chasing them the, the, where the money was. And giving them what they wanted. Don't go against, I'll use the um, swim with the current. Yeah. I'm guilty of this multiple times in my career. We all are. Where you, you're so obsessed and you think that this is what, and then you're going upstream. Yeah. We have all, you know, done that before. Everyone has done this. It's tough to swim against the current. Yeah. It's tough. What do you think, uh, where do you think there are, in, in, you can stay specific to your your vertical, but where do you think the the big opportunities are? Like in in other words, and this is so broad, but so it might be hard to answer. But where do you think the big opportunities are to differentiate your business that a lot of people might be missing in today's marketplace? In today's marketplace, I mean, um, specifically like an, uh, like an, like a startup idea. Well, or, you can go there. I mean, that's what you're in. So yeah, um, we should we should be smart enough in the audience to be able to say, to hear your answer, and say how does that apply to me? Sure. Um, so again, being you know investing in tech companies, yeah. right? Just to, I'll just kind of stay in my 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 swim lane here. Um, we are, um, you know, and where I think there's still ample opportunity we already talked about sort of industries that are old school and inadequate software that's fun financial uh financial technology is a is a booming space yeah. um removing the middleman to between brands and consumers which is d2c direct to consumer yeah definitely know that world um 
and we're excited about it. Um, you know, wellness overall yeah. is we have three inv- uh, t- two wellness. Um, you know, Scott, it's a different. We're at a different time in society now where there's a certain level of so, like but, health. But you, all right, so you've come up with all these different industries, right? These are verticals that we like. Yeah, and so out of all of those, is there a common thing that like said, you know what, one thing that could really differentiate this company, whether it's in wellness or in tech, whatever it is, is there this over real common thing that like if they focused on this, it, it would be a big help to, the, to them as, as a business or a company? Um, customer support, whatever, whatever it is, better technology. It's, to speed I mean, again, things up, I, you know. it, uh, it, it's data, okay. it's analytics, it's insights, it's yeah. research. So, well, so wellness, medical te- tech and health tech. Yeah. Where I was going with this is like, as a society, people are more aware of how to take care of themselves than ever before. Okay. Yeah. And that vertical of helping people live longer or be healthier or whatnot is very exciting. And venture is pouring money in there, and consumers want it, and we all know, ins- like you know, insurance companies are a shit show, and all that. So, any anything that supports, um, anything that can sort of support a an output of how to measure if you have diabetes, or you know, uh, how to stay keep your weight in check, or how to do home fitness better. I'm just staying in this so example. So where, but where where is the differentiator? And what I mean by that is it is it in it, and if you're a business and that's the world you're in, mm-hmm. is it in getting information easier to consumers? Is it, hey, uh, yes. we make, so, 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 so I, I, I follow where you're going. Right. It's reducing friction. Where's the easy button? Yeah. Let me check my blood at home. I don't want to go to a clinic. Right. Let me, um, let me push, my EKG let me push, my Apple let me push a button and get the result. Like remove friction. Do I have to get into a car? Do I have to go to a waiting room? Do I have to sign up? Yeah. What do I have to click on a link? Yeah. That reducing friction and simplicity. Think about Venmo, right? We have our dinner tonight. Yep. We split it. Yeah. I push a button. I send you fifty bucks. Yeah. Right. So or that's or, a, or, or 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 I said not a great dinner in or, New York. I know that's pretty cheap. <laughs> that's a cheap date. That's a very cheap date. Let's hope we do better. You, you made it sound like we were going to go out drinking. I know. Stuff I know. Like I know. That. I know. <laughs> Cocktails here are probably like twenty five bucks each. Um, or it could be, hey, uh, let's let's sign that doc, docu sign, docu set, like docu sign. Um, yeah. Just gene, like you know what I've told people, Scott. Like those founders deserve to be so wealthy, faster and easier. The, the whole in thing. back less coming, effort. Sorry, coming back again. Inadequate to a, a and people always need to sign docs. People are always going to need to go to the doctor. These things aren't going to change. So this is a let me let me summarize it like this because I don't think I did a good job. Cons- where and where is it that consumer behavior, right, is not changing, but the path in which well, people which are moving this for or are, are, are actually experiencing it is terrible. Home telephone, like think about all the things that are going away, yeah. like prints or yeah. when you or Apple Pay. Yeah. What's the commonality? Speed and efficiency. Yeah. People I, are people are slow and they're lazy. And they have this is everybody, yep. and attention uh, deficit is you know. So if you if you solve that, and I don't have to go to a thing called a fax or you know, that's that those are great great. Um, and again, for your audience, if if they're you know you're thinking about something, write ten ideas on a whiteboard. I mean, if you don't have a whiteboard, get a whiteboard. And guess what? Over time, check one off. You don't have any ideas suck for even the smartest people before yeah. they land on one or two well I, it's I okay lo- i the love the funnel process love what you just said finally so let's I fi- so 45 minutes later it took us, i say something intelligent i'm right? gonna let everybody know and i'll put this in okay. the, the the promo video just go to minute 45 right just skip <laughs> skip it all but if i'm a business i'm coming to you and, and i'm just like chris i need money here and here's why here's the idea i've got what do you think and instead of coming to you saying, look how we're going to disrupt the market. Look how we're going to be completely different and do all this stuff. Versus what I would want to do is focus exactly with what you just said. And that is, I'm going to fit, focus on not what might change, but will never change. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like you said, people will always want things faster, easier, right? And for less money if possible. Mm-hmm. So 
my idea is I'm going to be different and I am going to change things up because I'm going to do this differently. Mm -hmm. But by doing this, people will then be able to get this faster, cheaper, less effort, whatever all these things are. So the goal needs to be that. What's not going to change? How do I fix that? If you're being different for the sake of being different, that's not going to work. Correct. I no no further comments. I mean, like that that's that that that's that's exactly the framework. I think yeah. that's the way that you should think about it. Um, not sure, Scott, if you've heard this company called Amazon before. Yeah. Well, right? he's, he kind of yeah, yeah. I mean, so so this is I'm the, paraphrasing a little bit of, of yeah. I mean, this Jeff this, says that, this is um, I guess you I know the fat. Sure, <laughs> Jeff, Jeff will love it. Um, so. This is the fastest growing you know company on the planet, and they're. And for all the reasons that, that people know, they, 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 they've solved a pain point around shopping and speed. Yeah. And so again, if that's the, if that's kind of the lar- if that's kind of the, the biggest milestone in regards to like achieving e-commerce success, there are still plenty, plenty of industries and plenty of verticals that there's still friction. And remember an hour, whatever it was, I kept saying, find the pain. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. Where is it? Where? If you, you know what, if you, if you go outside and you ask, if you can find 20 people that are all like, you know, what sucks. And they all say the same thing. Go fix that. Right. That's exactly right. Go fix that. It's a great point. Yeah. Um, all right. Let me ask you one final question. Yeah. And all I got right. one more thing to plug. Perfect. I'm going to give you that. Opportunity. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Is there anything I haven't asked you about getting started, about identifying differentiators or increasing the wealth that you can just add to it? I'll make this an easy question. Be a student. Study, read, yeah. learn. Don't be a wannabe. Don't want to be an entrepreneur. If you're, don't, don't try to be a founder. Don't be the hipster in the coffee shop wearing the, like, the toboggan hat. Because like, Be a student. Study, read, get into the trenches, um, and think about it go at this for the right reasons if you're think if the first thing is money or headline you're gonna fail yeah i guarantee you're gonna fail if it's i have a deep emotion connection to this and we didn't spend enough time talking about it but i have a co-founder who's brilliant and i have another co-founder and now i've developed it like take your you know you may have to be in a shitty job for a while suck it up but uh, you know this the start off point is always kind of the the probably the hardest, but also the most magical. Yeah. And you can't force it. You know those people that are like single for ages and they're like, I wish I could get married. And you know, next thing you know, it's Sunday night, you happen to be buying tomatoes at Whole Foods and you meet your wife. Like, <laughs> right. you can't. So that, the, the, those sort of, the, the, those sorts of, the, I think if there's advice that I think is, is, is imperative, it's that combined with once you do get there, Roll up your, you know, we talked about it. Roll up your sleeves and, and get as much sort of um, traction proof points independently to show that you're you're in it for the long haul. Yeah. Why would anyone give you money unless you're willing for the next five or six years to sacrifice? You don't you don't deserve their money. And you don't deserve it. And if you're not out there trying to get money, I'll add to that. Increasing the value of your business is is priority number yeah. one, anyways. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're trying to raise funds yeah. or not. If you're out there and you've already got an established business and, yeah. and you're rolling, you're still trying to increase the value. Correct. So, uh, outstanding interview. Yeah, no, I enjoyed it. All right, thank my, you very much. My last, my last yeah, plug, Scott, whether you edit no, this out or not. we will not. For founders anywhere, yeah. in Louisville, in New York, or anywhere your listeners are, on April 16th, 2020, in three months, we have our Story Summit. You need to be there. Storysummit.com. Yeah. Story Summit is a dedicated day of founders talking to founders. I've been to 200 conferences in my life. Conferences suck. There are panels after panels, keynotes after keynotes, people talking at people. This is 140 people, YPO style tracks. How to deal with that founder. How to get your company off the ground. How does a podcast move the needle for my business? So it's not about pitching it and saying I'm crushing it, which is generally the ethos that people want to give off that they're doing so well. This is a day where we're going to lower our guard. We're going to be vulnerable and honest. And we're going to have leaders moderate conversations throughout the whole day. So hopefully people walk out. And if they learn one or two things that help them in their difficult startup journey, that's the output. So storysummit.com, yeah. um, April 16th. 
register. Where is it at here? Here in New York yeah. at Convene, um, you know, the co-working space Convene. I'm going to do you a step further. We'll put the link also on our Move Crush Town page as well. Love that. By the way, love the name of the show. Oh, great. Thank you. Great a lot name of people, of show. You know, I never tell everybody, I've never told anybody, what it is. it's move the crowd, crush the competition, yeah. count the money. Yeah. And, and no, so, no, it's a, it's, 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 it's a great name. Good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Scott. That's awesome.